All right, so in this video, we're going to be going over the uh, seven steps for uh, doing a tech interview with an example. After this video, there's going to be four videos that show um, real like live mock interviews with um, some TAs who have so graciously volunteered to do that. And so after watching this and seeing the steps, it'll be really helpful to then go and watch the mock interviews and see those uh, steps live. Now these seven steps are pretty common. Um, you'll see them probably in a lot of different places. Um, they aren't all, there aren't always seven of them, but they're all really similar um, uh, and have a little a lot of overlap with this. And I really like these seven steps. I've seen so many uh, demo interviews with these steps, real interviews with the steps, recordings of these um, mock interviews with these steps, and they're really, really, really good ones to follow. And it really helps give you some structure when you're doing your interview. So the very first step is to listen, and this is actually a really, really important step that people forget because it happens right at the beginning of the interview. <laughs> people are nervous. Um, they're uh, having a hard time focus on, focusing on what the question is, and um, they're thinking really, really rapidly about the question. So it's important to kind of embrace this step a little bit and take a second to listen and think. And then this step also needs to be followed throughout the interview. You really have to listen to your inter interviewer. They are generally on your side and when they are telling you something or asking you a question, it's probably to move you in the right direction in like 95% of the time. And you want to make sure you pay really a close attention to what they say. Sometimes it's like a really, really leading hint when you're kind of stuck um, because they don't want to see you stuck either. It's really hard to watch someone be stuck. Uh, so that's the first step. The second step is to ask clarifying questions. Again, this is very, very commonly overlooked uh, in interviews. Um, you need to make sure that you understand the question and that the interview, the interviewer has, um, that you've gone back and forth enough that you both are on the same page of what you're trying to solve. Interview questions are oftentimes purposely ambiguous. You know, they're not giving you function signatures usually. They're sometimes not even giving you an example. Sometimes they will. Um, sometimes it won't specify like, oh, this needs to be an integer or, oh, this, you know, you can assume that this is going to be sorted or even or odd or, you know, all these things. And so you need to ask all those questions um, to make sure that you aren't solving a problem that's much harder than what they're asking you to do. Um, and it's really helpful during the clarify stage to give examples, say, okay, if you have these two inputs and this is the output, is that, am I understanding this correctly on what you want? <coughs> Oftentimes, whatever the problem is that they're asking you to solve is really um, well suited to writing it in a function signature. And so it's like a very nice way to start because it is the like, like last clarification that you need is, you know, you write out your function signature and you say to the interviewer, is this function sign signature fit the problem you're asking me to solve? Does it look right? And they can tell you to make sure that that the things coming in and the things going out are expected. Um, and it also gives you a little bit of time to continue to think about your solution um, as you're writing out the signature, which is usually not the most difficult part. Now, after you have fully understood the problem, um, you're going to, you're going to be thinking about how to solve it. And you, you'll, you're, you're going to think of maybe a couple different ways in, and maybe know that the first way that you think of isn't going to be good enough. Um, a brute force method is usually something that's like n squared or n cubed or like n factorial, something really bad. And so that they ask you a question, you're like, well, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is, and you know, you're going to not want to say that. That's what a lot of people think, but you want to say that because talking through your brute force met method, um, can be a nice conversation between you and the interviewer and it can move you into something that is better, right? And 
sometimes you might not optimize your solution and your brute force method is your only one to go off of. And that's okay. Um, writing down the code for the brute force method is better than not doing anything at all. And while you write the code for the brute force method, maybe you'll think of the optimization while you're doing it. So talk through your brute force method first, state the big O, and then say, I'm pretty sure that there has to be a better way to do this. Um, and usually the interviewer will kind of encourage you like, yeah, there is, can you think of it? And then maybe it's not, maybe you think it's a bad solution, but it's exactly what you should be solve, you know, writing out the code for it. And your, your interviewer should be like, well, it's probably pretty good. Or they might explicitly tell you, yeah, actually there's no better way to do it that I know of. Once you get the brute force method talked out, you should not start coding it. Um, you're going to start working on improving the solution. You, you could um, write the brute force method out in pseudocode if you want, um, if it's necessary, um, and start working on an improved solution. Uh, and, you know, if you're typing it, which these are used to be whiteboard interviews, um, and maybe some of them still will be if you have the ability to like write on a stylus, um, but if you're writing in on code um, when you're typing, just write them in comments. So then you're going to work on optimizing your solution. It's going to be a lot of back and forth and talking. Um, not too long because you do want to get to coding, but you want to make sure that you have a solution before you start coding. So you're going to work on um, a lim uh, lowering your big O. And once you've done that, you're going to start writing your code. <coughs> Write helper functions. Um, so that there's, if there's really annoying things that you need to code up, um, you can write a function and say, oh, I'll implement that later. Uh, so like if there's like a messy string parsing or um, some, you know, messy like search or sort or something like that, you can just write it as a helper function and just, you know, declare the function, but don't write it. And then at the end, if there's time and they want you to, you can start implementing those helper functions. Um, it's more important that you get your full code out. Uh, another example would be like file reading, right? File reading is often really messy and it's probably not what they're interested in seeing you code. So if there was a reason to file read, which there probably won't, would never be, you would wanna just write like a helper function, read file, this is what comes in, this is what comes out. The last step is to test your code. Now this does not mean compile and run your code on examples. It means to trace your code with examples. So you should have come up with examples during the clarify step and now you're going to run those examples through your code and trace them manually and say okay well in this loop you know this variable is going to hold this this value for this input and then work through and show that it works. This is a really important stage because you'll find a lot of bugs in your code while you test it. Um, and it's very unlikely that you're writing compilable code that you can then test um, you know, in, in the IDE that you might be writing in. So you should plan to be testing your code manually. Here's an example of these seven steps. So I'm going to use this, co um, this coding prompt, which is given an array, find the max product of any two values. So that's the prompt. So you should have lots and lots of questions after you hear this prompt. So, for example, you need, you need to clarify. So the first thing to do is to write out an example and ask questions. Can the numbers be negative? Can I assume they're integers? Is the array sorted? Can I use a vector or do I need to use an, you know, a C array? It depends on you know, what language you're working in because you can work in any language usually. Um, uh, can there be duplicates? Like you don't want to overdo it and ask every possible thing, but ask some clarifying questions. Um, maybe say, do I need to handle edge cases? Uh, like, can I assume the array is non-empty? Um, those types of things. And they might answer those questions and they might say, you know, just go ahead and continue on and code and that's okay. Um, but one really good thing in clarif clarifying is to do a couple examples. So here's an example where the negative values are the max. You should do some with positive values. You should do some with duplicates, etc. Once you clarify the problem, then you're going to move on to the function signature. So you're going to write out a function signature and then you're going to um, uh, check to see if it's okay with the interviewer. You're going to use a good function name that has good style using 
you know, lower camel case, upper camel case, uh, whatever it is, and stay consistent with it. Real syntax, it's important that you have actual real syntax for whatever language you're using. Um, you don't really need to worry about this, um, you know, making a function public or anything like that in C++ or Java. Um, it wouldn't matter either way. This is just real code that's pulled up for this solution. Um, but check with the interviewer and say, does this function signature look good? Am I understanding the, you know, the problem okay? Um, okay, then you move on to a brute force method. So what you might say uh, here is, okay, I, I know that the, that, that one option for solving this problem is, what if I just uh, loop through every element of the array and multiply every other element in the array in a nested for loop. So I do the first one and compare it with the rest. Um, and I keep track of a, a live max. So every time if I find a higher maximum value, then I'm going to replace the old one. And um, by doing that, I'll definitely have the max two values because I'm doing every possible combination. Um, so this is the code. You shouldn't ever write this code um, unless you haven't figured out a better solution. Um, so uh, instead you should, you know, continue to talk about the brute force method until you can kind of come up with a better method. Uh, but this is an example of writing it up. You know, some of the syntax might not make sense to you because like, you know, there's no length method in the C array um, and stuff like that. Uh, you, could just, you could just say that you assume that you know there is or that function exists you know they don't know what abstractions you're using um, so some of that is okay uh, but it's better to probably use um, uh, standard libraries if you can remember them um, but as long as it follows the like general pattern of abstractions you're like definitely okay okay so um, you're on the brute force method and then they're going to say, okay, well, what's the big O of that? And you're going to say, okay, this is an N squared solution. I know that that's not good and I know there has to be a better way to do it. So then you're going to talk about improving the solution. So do we really need to multiply every single pair in order to solve this problem? Is that really necessary in order to find the brute force or in the, to, in, and find the max two pairs? I'm only finding two pairs that are creating a max, right? Or one pair, two values that are the maximum value. So um, it seems overkill to compare every single value. So you talk about it and you kind of come up with a better solution. And so one, optim one more optimum solution, and one thing that would probably come to mind as you're thinking about this is you're like, oh, actually, if I sorted it, then I would know that the top two numbers are the max. And then maybe you would realize that actually if what if the values were negative, so I'd have to also look at the bottom two values. And then, so if I sorted it and then found the first two, um, top two and the bottom two, and then whichever one of those is bigger, that would find the max. And then you could talk through that, okay, that requires sorting. Sorting is n log n. You can't do better than n log n. So, um, that's better than n squared and then maybe you could even ask the interviewer is that okay or do you think that is there an even more optimal solution that I should continue to think about um, and they would say oh actually you can do even better than that and what you can do that's better than that in this particular case is it's not necessary to sort all the values because you're not interested in knowing the order of all of the values you only want the top two and the bottom two so um, you're doing a lot of unnecessary work by sorting the whole array. So instead, just find the two maxes and the two mins. So to do that, you have to go through all the values to find the two maxes and the two mins, but it's only O of N, right? It's only going through the list one time to come up with those uh, two maxes, or those two um, largest positive and those two smallest negative. So you write out some comments here to kind of indicate what your game plan is. So if you don't get to any of this, at least they know that you know how to solve the problem, right? It's a really, really good strategy. 
So um, this is going to be finding the positive and negative values. This is going to be comparing the two of them to see which one's bigger returning and then there'll be some edge cases at the top to consider things that um, you know fall outside of that pattern. So here is um, an implementation. <laughs> this particular implementation actually uh, writes like a little class in order to find the, the min and the max. So you can kind of look at it to see uh, what it looks like. It makes it so that they only have to call like one thing here. Um, but you don't have to do it that way. You could just write the code there or write a helper function that finds the largest two min and the max. And it's basically all what you already know. It's just looping through. Um, an array and keeping track of the, you know, the top two maxes and the bottom two um, mins, I guess. And um, here it's calling the max function in order to figure out which one of those is greater. Some of the edge cases that you can come up with, okay, well, what if you have an empty array? What if you have an array that only has one element in it? In both of those cases, we could say that there is no max value, so we'll return um, nothing, basically, um, and then uh, or return zero um, is what it would end up doing um, because this is a long. And then another edge case is if there's only two values in the array, then why bother going through and calculating the O of N, you know, max values? Uh, because um, you know what the max value is, it's the two multiplied by each other. And you want to think about those. What you also want to do is test your code and make sure it works. And to test your code after you've written it up, uh, just go ahead and give it um, an input array. So let's say array is this and then trace your code. So you'd go through the boundary cases and say, okay, this is not true um, because uh, the array size isn't empty and it isn't um, have one value. The uh, This isn't true because there's more than two values. And so then you're going to go into this function and you're going to go and initialize these variables. And then here you're going to loop through an array and keep track of uh, these maxes. So basically what's going to happen here is um, if your i value is uh, greater than zero, then um, you're going to go into here. It's not because we're on the first one. So we're going to skip that and we're going to go down here. So for the first value, we're right here. Uh, I is um, is is I less than the negative mass ma the negative max um, oh this is actually the value of the array it's a for each loop I was getting confused uh, so it is zero. So if i is greater than zero, you'd go in here. And then if it's here, that's confusing that it's using an i. Um, so is zero less than negative max? No. Is uh, zero less than negative max two? No. So none of those are true. So none of these if statements are true. So it skips everything. Um, then it's going to go to four. So then it's going to check is four greater than zero? Yes, it is. Um, so is four greater than um, max of zero? Yes, so it's going to go in. Is max one greater than max two? Um, it's not, and so max one is going to get set to four. You're going to continue this process and work through the algorithm. If it, this one's kind of like, oh, like it's taking me a long time to go through it, I'm kind of doing a bad job of it, but you do want to make sure that if it's taking a really long time to go through and test your code, um, you you might want to pick a shorter array. Um, so maybe it would be better if I just picked um, 0, 4, 3 and then another one that's 0, negative 4, negative 4. But you do want to do this, right? Um, you want to make sure you do it. And this is a much simpler problem than what you'd have. So some of these you know details would not probably be uh, so messy um, in a 
in a more interesting problem where there's like um, a higher level of abstraction. But that's the idea of it. <laughs> and when, when you do this, um, it's hard to see on this particular example in some ways, but if there's some mistakes in here, you might catch them during the testing phase, which is what's really good about testing. So this is the general seven step process for how to kind of work through the interview. It's really nice to have steps, you know, it gives you some structure to how you approach the interview. Um, now we are going to, um, in the next four videos, uh, you can go ahead and watch some real uh, mock interviews being conducted and that might be a little bit more powerful to kind of see this.